Um, I wanted to bring up um, the dean, Chris Mayer, uh, to, to the podium. You may have heard him on Fox 31. Uh, we had a loss of a really a leader in the national policy in the United States. But he has spoken about her. He has been a friend of hers and just wanted a couple of moments uh, for him to kind of tell you a little bit about her. And so, um, thank you. Yeah, so, so, uh, obviously, if you were to do that, I'm all right. But, um, you know, first of all, uh, you know, you're all over the place. Pretty spot on. And then indeed, the day before Russia invaded Ukraine, when she has terminal cancer, she publishes an op-ed in the Washington Post that you should go back and read it. It's extraordinary. It's just exactly right. And she describes meeting Putin and taking the measure of the man and her assessment of Putin actually going way back is, is remarkably prescient and her view of what really is facing the world, um, I think, remarkably clear-eyed. So I think it's a great loss, you know, personally, you know, I mean, uh, uh, for me, I, um, her brother's on my board, I get to I'm talking with him, we're um, quite a bit lately, um, for our, my school, I think for, for Denver, uh, as many of you know, we were intent on giving her a, a the council was in town of giving her a lifetime achievement award. She had agreed to do that. We're tr we've been trying to find a time for her to, to do it. We, we have some discussion on, I guess, now about maybe doing that posthumously, um, but uh, a, a, real, a real loss uh, for, I think, for all of us and, and for the community. But the thing, I'd, I'd, you know, the thing I would take away from her is just, just incredible um, deep belief in the American experience, the American experiment, um, and uh, uh, a lifetime of incredible service to the country and certainly an inspiration for many, especially I would say many young women. Um, she tells a funny story about our daughters uh, growing up and she, she you know, Madeline, uh, and then Condoleezza Rice, who was Joseph Corbell's student and our alum, uh, and there's so many women who've now been Secretary of State and the, her daughter hears her being introduced and, and uh, the introduction is saying, you know, Madeleine Albright, the, you know, the first woman Secretary of State, she 
and then and her daughter said, what's, what's the big deal? I thought only women could be secretaries of state. So she, she paved the way for a lot of people. Anyway, loss for all of us um, and worth just taking this moment, I think, to, to remember Madeline. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Dean. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna make a, an announcement before they start moving stuff away from the table. And if you've already taken the book off the table and hidden it in your backpack, um, don't tell anyone, but um, we have put a little tag, I think it's underneath the coffee cups. Um, if you have that tag, um, uh, our speaker tonight, William Drozdiak's uh, most recent book is uh, on the table and um, you get to win that. So um, it's an excellent book and he will be talking a little bit about that and a whole bunch of other things tonight. But let me first introduce you to our speaker. Uh, for more than four decades, William Drozdiak has been regarded as one of the most knowledgeable American observers of European affairs. He's currently Global Europe Fellow with the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. Before that, he was previously Senior Advisor for Europe and Eurasia with McClarty Associates, an international strategic consultancy firm. From 2015 to 2020, he was a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, affiliated with the Center on the United States and Europe. During his two decades as senior editor and foreign correspondent for the Washington Post, uh, the Post won the Pulitzer Prize for its international reporting. As correspondent covering events in Europe and the Middle East, William Drozdiak reported on the Iran-Iraq war the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and events leading to the German reunification. As the Post Bureau Chief in Paris and Berlin, and as its Chief European Correspondent in Brussels from 1990 to 2001, he conducted interviews with many leading statesmen and covered many major political, economic, security issues across Europe including the enlargement of NATO and the European Union and the Balkan Wars. Before joining the Washington Post, Mr. Drozdiak was a State Department correspondent for Time Magazine and an international affairs writer at its New York headquarters. He also covered the Middle East while based in Cairo and Beirut for the Time Magazine and the Washington Star. He's written extensively for many other publications, including Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, Newsweek, and the Financial Times. Mr. Drozdiak served from 2005 to 2015 as president of the American Council on Germany, like I said before. So we've got a lot of people here tonight uh, that are members of that organization. This is one of the most prestigious nonprofit organizations devoted to cooperation and understanding between the United States, Germany, and Europe. For his achievements with the American Council on Germany, he was awarded the Officer's Cross and the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany by uh, the President of Germany at the time. We are pleased to welcome several members, as I said, of the uh, ACG, and they've joined us this evening. He was the founding executive director for the Transatlantic Center on Brussels, in Brussels, Belgium. Uh, this was created in 2001 by the German Marshall Fund of the United States to serve as the hub of its operations in Europe and as an independent nonpartisan think tank for the United States European relations. He's also an award-winning journalist as I've indicated somewhat previously. Um, his book, Fractured Continent, Europe's Crisis, Crisis, Crises and the Fate of the West was cited by the Financial Times as one of the best political books of 2017. His latest book, the last president of Europe, Emmanuel Macron's rise to revive France and save the world, and is the subject of the talk this evening, among other things. Before becoming a journalist, he played professional basketball in the United States and Europe from 1971 to 1978. He graduated from the University of Oregon with degrees in political science and economics and was awarded a postgraduate fellowship as an NCAA scholar athlete. He earned master's degrees in economics at the College of Europe in, in Bruges, and also did 
postgraduate studies at the Institute of European Studies at the University of Belgium. He's received the Distinguished Alumnus Award and served as commencement speaker at the University of Oregon. He's a lifetime member of the Council on Foreign Relations and former trustee of the International School of Brussels. Brussels. He speaks fluent German, French and German and uh, has conversational usage of Italian, Spanish, and Dutch. He is married in, uh, to a retired Belgian diplomat who is her country's consul general in New York and later ambassador to the Czech, to the Czech Republic. They have three, go, three grown children, which is probably their greatest accomplishment, Nicholas, Karen, and, Nat, and uh, Natalia. I'd like to welcome uh, this distinguished speaker tonight, as you can tell from his resume. Um, I think this is gonna be an awesome conversation, especially in light of the world events today. So I'd like to welcome uh, William Drozdiak to the stand. Well, thank you very much, Rob, for that uh, generous uh, introduction. And um, thank you all of you who are, have come out tonight. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back in Denver. I spoke here some years ago, um, but it's a beautiful part of the country and I really welcome the opportunity to come back here. Uh, listening to uh, Dr. Myers' remarks about Madeleine Albright uh, reminded me of my own time following her as a, as a correspondent when she was Secretary of State and then later on, after she retired, um, we went on some trips together, including to, uh, to Davos, uh, Switzerland, for one of these gatherings. And Madeline had a, <clears throat> a great uh, sense of uh, humor, self-deprecation even. And uh, I was wait waiting for her at, at the, in the airport lounge. I got through security, and then she was held up. And, uh, I said, well, Madeline, what happened? She said, you won't believe it. They pulled me aside for a pat down. And she says, you know, and I never say this, but I said to them, do you know who I am? <laughs> and she said, the guy responded with it, says, no, but we have a doctor who can help you figure that out. And she proceeded to use that line uh, on several occasions in her speeches, but uh, she had a wonderful sense of humor. And when we would travel together, she would say, yeah, we're on the same basketball team. So, you know, <laughs> it's quite, quite something. Well, I'm here to talk about, uh, unfortunately, a, a very serious uh, set of subjects. Uh, it's, this is a dark age in Europe right now with this uh, terrible uh, aggression by Russia in um, Ukraine and also the uncertainty that, uh, that this um, um, uh, conflict uh, poses for uh, the future of, uh, of the Western Alliance. And it's often been said, uh, this is a hinge moment in history, uh, much like 9-11 changed the world as we knew it. And indeed, everything has changed right now, starting with the priorities of, of the Biden administration. <clears throat> when President Biden first took office, uh, he made it clear that everything in foreign policy was gonna be about China, dealing with the threat in the Indo-Pacific. And in fact, uh, that was reflected for those of us who follow uh, these things closely in Washington, D.C. by the makeup of the National Security Council. He put uh, Kurt Campbell, a hard charging policy wonk in charge uh, as the named him as the czar for uh, the Indo-Pacific and Kurt uh, hired 26 PhDs uh, to fill out his empire um, in dealing with uh, coming up with a new policy to treat uh, China. And meanwhile, Europe and Russia were allocated two positions only two people were dealing with Europe and Russia at the time. So it seemed pretty clear, and this resonated in Europe, um, in the, the capitals of Europe, uh, who governments who started to fear that uh, the United States really was turning its back 
on Europe and turning uh, facing uh, new um, challenges. Indeed, I was doing some research on a book I had planned at the time about uh, what would be the impact in Europe on America's shift toward Asia, because this really predated uh, the Trump administration. Obama announced it, uh, and Biden was determined to, to follow through with this. And they, they, their attitude was that politically it made sense because China was the existential threat to the United States. And after 75 years of the US being the linchpin of the Atlantic Alliance, it was high time for Europe, uh, which is rich enough and strong enough to defend uh, itself and its own interests. And that would provide a better uh, division of labor within the uh, Atlantic Alliance. Uh, but the Europeans, of course, were rather nervous about whether they would be capable of, of handling this. Well, <clears throat> along came the, uh, when the Russians started building up their forces uh, around Ukraine, um, Europeans were still in a denial uh, mode. And the, um, they said, oh, this is likely to be a bluff. Uh, well, I think the, the turning point in this happened last November when uh, Bill Burns, the CIA director, who was a former ambassador to Russia um, in, uh, for four years and got to know Putin quite well then, uh, was sent as a personal emissary <clears throat> by President Biden to, uh, to Russia to talk to uh, Vladimir Putin. And Burns came back with a very uh, serious message. He said, I'm convinced he's going to attack. Um, and uh, he said, he told me, uh, Repeatedly, I warned him about the risk of sanctions and how this would devastate Russia's economy. And he said he repeated to me in Russian and then in Latin, a phrase that said, the die is cast. We're going, it's basically said, admitted he, they were going in. And this changed the whole approach of the Biden administration, even though they still had not persuaded the Europeans. And the main interlocutor, was a person I've gotten to know rather well, uh, President Emmanuel Macron of France. Um, I, uh, I, my book is, uh, began with uh, conversations we had after he won the presidency. Um, and I, I wanted to learn more about his personal vision because he was a 39 year old whiz kid who had never been elected to public office before and suddenly uh, ascended to the presidency of France. And I thought, this is good, stands in great contrast to our own country where our leading politicians are in their late seventies, even early eighties. And when are we going to move to our new generation? Suddenly France has this new leader. So we got to, we had several conversations and uh, <clears throat> this led to this book project and we stayed in touch. Um, over over the years, and Emmanuel Macron told me um, it's important to keep the dialogue going with Putin, even if he does follow through on this uh, uh, war with Ukraine. And his belief was that uh, somebody has to confront him with the reality because he is so isolated over the past two years. His his uh, paranoia about uh, about the pandemic, about COVID, as you would seen uh, reflected in the long table that he uses to receive vi visitors in the Kremlin. Um, and also the, the, uh, the sense that he, is, uh, he wants to make his mark in history by reconquering um, territory <clears throat> that once belonged uh, to the Soviet Union. So Macron has kept up this dialogue and I've when I last saw him about two weeks ago on uh, uh, Friday, um, he was saying, I've, we've spoken 17 times since the start of the year. And most of those calls were instigated by uh, Vladimir Putin because Putin also wanted to hear uh, Macron's view, what other Western leaders were saying to him. And I said, well, you, you're getting attacked everywhere saying you're, you're not making any progress, you're not persuading him, 
um, to back down. You're making yourself, subjecting yourself to some even ridicule because uh, you're failing to make progress. He said, I realize that, but it's important to keep the door open, to keep a dialogue going, to make him realize that uh, uh, there's a kernel of truth in what I'm saying. And I tell him, you're lying to yourself um, and you've got to face up to the uh, facts. Otherwise it's going to be a, a disaster for your country. Well, so far those conversations have proven fruitless. Macron has bent over backwards to um, convey the substance of these conversations to uh, President Biden um, and transatlantic uh, uh, partnership has really been superb throughout the, the whole course of this uh, conflict. Indeed, NATO, which was struggling to find a, <clears throat> a purpose has suddenly been revitalized uh, by the threat on its Eastern border. And I think uh, now, uh, not just the Eastern uh, countries who are the new members of NATO, but also uh, the old uh, members such as Germany are awakening to the fact that uh, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this really has to be the foundation of uh, their future as a healthy and successful democracy. Indeed, Germany, has reversed in something of a revolution uh, its pacifist culture by announcing a hundred billion dollar extra in uh, defense spending, um, sending arms to Ukraine, which had, had never done before, and uh, vowing that Europe will become um, a more serious uh, uh, defense entity. And this plays in, this has gratified President Macron no end because he has, uh, in our conversations, he consistently said, since the end of the Cold War, there's a new order, but uh, nothing really has changed. It's, uh, Europe is still totally dependent on the United States for its security. And we need to move away from that paradigm and create something new. Uh, well, now uh, with Russia being embraced by China, uh, Europe realizes that it needs to stand up not just to defend its own interests, but also in, in partnership with the United States if the democracies are going to uh, prevail against the, uh, the autocracies of, of China and Russia. So this, is, uh, this conflict has raised all sorts of questions uh, as to <clears throat> what will happen from here. We've all seen these horrific uh, images of uh, the atrocities committed <clears throat> outside of Kiev in uh, recent weeks and calls for a war crimes tribunal have, uh, have been uh, getting louder and louder, although it's hard to see how we're ever going to get uh, Vladimir Putin into uh, uh, a tribunal. Um, his uh, standing in Russia, strangely enough, has actually soared <clears throat> since this conflict began largely due to the fact that the state-run television uh, and propaganda devices have, have persuaded mainly the older population of Russia that, that uh, what he's doing uh, is actually in defense of Russia's interests <clears throat> and uh, against the Nazification of Ukraine, which is ridiculous, but it is persuading much of the, the population. So with Putin uh, having such a strong <clears throat> support within the country and seeming to have uh, no real rivals on the inside, it's hard to see how we are going to uh, dislodge him um, anytime soon. So what I think is absolutely vital is for the West to continue um, showing greater and greater unity and for Europe um, to uh, develop uh, stronger policies that will revamp its energy structure. And this is something Macron has been pushing um, uh, very much uh, that there should be a, a common energy market for Europe as a way of ending its dependency on Russian oil and gas, particularly a country like Germany, which gets 55% of its energy from, from Russia. <clears throat> so this would be 
I think an important development. Uh, Chrome makes the point that this would be a way to encourage uh, <clears throat> renewable energy uh, at the same time as reducing dependency on fossil fuels that have been um, uh, exploited by autocracies such as Saudi Arabia, Iran, <clears throat> and Russia in the past. So this would be a, a strong and healthy development if Europe could find a new um, uh, structure for its energy imports. And uh, an important player in that regard will be the United States uh, in terms of its liquefied natural gas. We have enormous reserves of natural gas. I know here in Denver, this is a very important energy sector. Um, and um, even though you may not export as much liquefied natural gas as they do say in Louisiana, but that is going to be a big change in the energy market, I think in the months and years to come with uh, Europe looking more toward the United States to provide these, uh, these supplies. And this will uh, again be a way to reduce the amount of money that is pouring into Russia um, um, for, to uh, fuel its war against uh, Ukraine. This year, Russia is expected to make 300, earn $350 billion <clears throat> in oil and gas revenues, which is three times what they made last year. And that is the money that is being used to perpetrate these terrible crimes in the Ukraine. Uh, so the sooner that politicians in Europe and in our country can uh, muster the courage to move quickly at warp speed in making these changes, I think the better uh, it, uh, it will be in terms of putting a swift end uh, to this conflict. Because the longer the war between uh, Ukraine and Russia goes on, the greater the risk will be to uh, drag in other uh, possible combatants. And not just in the Baltic states or Eastern Europe, but we're already seeing um, uh, fighters coming in from Syria uh, to uh, fight as mercenaries in this. And this would really <clears throat> uh, raise the, uh, the, the specter of a, a global world war that we all want to avoid. Uh, the, I want to also talk about the, uh, um, the political um, um, atmosphere in Europe because this is, this is very relevant to uh, the concerns of people like Madeleine Albright about fascism on the rise uh, in Europe. Just last Sunday, uh, Victor Urban, uh, who uh, has uh, uh, been uh, probably the leading figure in terms of an, the illiberal autocratic drive among Western democracies, uh, won a massive reelection. And so that is not good news um, for uh, the European Union, which uh, st uh, Hungary is still a member of the EU and also of NATO, <clears throat> we will still have to deal with this semi-autocrat uh, within these two institutions that are supposed to defend democracy. <clears throat> and then starting this Sunday, Emmanuel Macron will be up for re-election um, in France. And <clears throat> his main uh, antagonist is Marine Le Pen. It looks like uh, neither of them will uh, win 50%. So that means there will be a runoff in two weeks time, April 24th. And I really fear that uh, because the polls have been so inaccurate in the past, right now they show Macron with a three or 4% lead. Uh, but if, uh, if Le Pen should somehow uh, emerge as the next president of France, it could really signal the demise of the European Union, particularly in tandem with uh, the election of uh, re-election of Urban in Hungary, and also a, an illiberal um, uh, a regime in Poland, uh, which is uh, which has um, suppressed dissent, uh, the free press, and packed the court with its its closest allies. 
Um, so uh, in my view, the, uh, the importance of the election in France and Emmanuel Macron's re-election cannot be um, understated. I think that, that um, as Macron told me, he, he believes that he was elected on a platform five years ago, neither right nor left. He wanted to get rid of all the old ideologies and in the process he, he helped to demolish the mainstream political parties on the left, such as the Socialist Party, which is now reduced to just 1% in the polls, and also the Gaullists, the Conservative Party, which is still floundering in search of a, of a new leader. And instead, what we see now in France, but also elsewhere in Europe, is uh, a new political divide between uh, those who uh, believe in open communities, globalization, free trade, um, uh, the, the uh, willingness to help um, other uh, countries uh, dealing with climate change and uh, <clears throat> drought and, and, and immigration, and those who want a closed nationalistic uh, response. <clears throat> Because uh, the, uh, as Macron puts it to me, uh, the longer term threats that we see uh, on the horizon, because he's 30 years younger than me. And when I asked him, what will the world look like 30 years from now when you're my age? And he just said, uh, we, that we are going to be faced with a set of challenges uh, in the East, the North and the South and he said, for me, the biggest challenge will be Africa. One in three human beings will be African by uh, 2050. That uh, we already see the impact of, uh, uh, of climate change driving massive uh, immigration. He cited the example of Lake Chad, uh, where 15 million people live day to day on what they can, can get from uh, the lake. By 2030, that lake is going to dry up and those people will have to move and move right away. And they're not going to move to Mali or Niger. They're going to want to move to Europe. So there's going to be a tsunami of immigrants <clears throat> that threaten to come into uh, Europe out of desperation uh, to flee these uh, unliv the unlivable situation that they're, they're facing um, in Africa. And at the same time, we see drought uh, extending in areas such as Iran, elsewhere in the Middle East. <clears throat> the Syrian civil war continues more than 11 years later, further devastation. Uh, so the, the signs of hope, uh, uh, even for democracies, uh, are uh, looking slim. That's why it's going to be a <clears throat> an era that uh, that really calls for uh, political courage and uh, the willingness to uh, to take uh, uh, difficult and bold decisions to deal with the, the kind of action that that Madeleine Albright uh, was supporting, as as Fritz said, right until her uh, final days, uh, saying that we need to stand up and not be afraid of defending our convictions. So I think. Uh, I'm happy to uh, open it up to questions from the audience and uh, on any or all of these topics or anything else that's on your mind. I'm gonna be wandering around the room and anybody that has a question, raise your hand. Sid was waving in a big way, so I'm going to <laughs> Not in a big way. But, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you very much for sharing your insights. They're uh, sobering, uh, but enlightening. Uh, two questions, please. Do you subscribe to the view that Putin uh, has been and is now uh, setting his sights beyond uh, Ukraine? into other places such as the Baltic states or others? And second of all, uh, can you speculate uh, wildly perhaps, but speculate nonetheless, um, as to what would happen if there were uh, to be a different administration dealing with this issue? 
um, the, such as the past administration. Um, it, it, it's something I can't fathom, but perhaps you can help me understand that. Sure. Well, I think uh, Putin has made it quite clear that um, he wants to defend uh, what he says is the, the, uh, Russia's interests in the near abroad, starting with <coughs> 25 million Russians who are living outside of Russia's borders. <coughs> and two countries, uh, uh, two of the three Baltic states have significant Russian populations. Um, uh, I, I focused a, in a chapter on my previous book, Fractured Continent, on Latvia, because 28% are uh, of the population is ethnic Russian. And uh, the mayor of Riga is an ethnic Russian. I spend a lot of uh, time with him getting to know <clears throat> the beliefs and attitudes of, of the ethnic Russians there. <clears throat> they are not allowed to vote. So they feel discriminated against. Um, and you could easily see Putin making the argument or the rationale for a potential invasion or an undermining of a country like Latvia because saying, oh, I'm moving in to protect the interests of this imperiled Russian minority. And I think this is why um, he, needs to be taken seriously. Uh, what he's done in Ukraine uh, started in 2014, so ostensibly to rescue the Russian speaking minority in Eastern Ukraine. Now he says, we want to take over the whole country. He's had to back off because of the fierce resistance, but there, there are other places <clears throat> in Eastern Europe that we could see that, um, that happen. So I think the, um, uh, the, I think the fact that the Baltic states are active members of NATO, uh, are getting strong support now from uh, both the United States and European allies uh, in terms of sending troops and, and, and material to defend them is a strong signal to Putin that this would be a dangerous step toward a uh, major war with NATO. And I don't think he's in any position to, to do that. But still, just the, the, the feeling that <clears throat> they, he is convinced that the Russian minority in a country like Latvia <clears throat> needs to be defended uh, by all means, including uh, uh, media, uh, uh, cyber attacks, that sort of thing, uh, is... <clears throat> is something to be taken seriously. Now you ask about the attitude here in the United States. Not a lot of Americans are aware of these delicate relationships. Uh, Latvia having been a member of the Soviet Union, bordering Russia, um, the, their media is dominated by the Russian media. Uh, I think most Americans would say, well, is, is, do we really have a dog in this fight? Do we want to get him in, in, embroiled in a, a conflict uh, with Russia, which has 6,000 nuclear weapons? <coughs> I think there's a reluctance to, to see uh, our own interests uh, uh, jeopardized by, by going in there. But I think uh, people need to be uh, alerted to the fact that it's not just as Madeleine Albright would say, it, all of democracy, all democracies are under threat by what Russia is doing and that we need to be uh, aware of this. Whether the next government in the, the next administration <clears throat> takes a more um, alarmist view or a more interventionist view, it's hard to say. My own view, my own concern has been for some time that uh, the United States, uh, the population with good reasons wants to uh, pull back and, and spend more time rebuilding our own country. Uh, and that the attitude, the belief that after 75 years, Europe be, ought to be able to sort out its own problems. But <clears throat> as has been proven time and time again, it's uh, the United States plays such a vital role in sustaining uh, a safe and secure uh, order in Europe that if we were to 
pull out either gradually by shifting our resources and, intended, and attentions to the Indo-Pacific or, um, or suddenly because we don't want to get involved in a war. I think this could have disastrous consequences for the free world. <clears throat> Mr. Drossi, it's great that you came from Washington to the prairie. <laughs> and you talked to Macron, uh, the war came in February, Putin, Ukraine. Last year, they had a shipyard in France and they had uh, brand new submarines for Australia. In the old days, they want to do uh, something against China. And last year, uh, Washington DC and Great Britain, they said, uh, we did it better, we make submarines. And uh, shipyard in France, a lot of money. Uh, that was not so good. What uh, McCall say starting last year for the submarines? Sorry, I, I, what, what specific question? Uh, no, submarines. Uh, last year, uh, French uh, shipyards bought it. Uh, some uh, submarines for Australia. Oh, well, the, the obvious affair. Right. That was last year. What Macron right. said. Yeah, well, he's uh, he was infuriated <clears throat> by that deal and it was handled clumsily as President Biden said himself that um, uh, uh, France had a, had concluded a deal with the previous Austrian, Australian government um, to provide them with uh, submarines, six, a big contract, 60 billion euros worth. Initially, um, the, uh, the French government, which makes excellent top quality nuclear submarines said, nuclear submarines will be more efficient for you. But the prime minister at the time, Malcolm Turnbull said, well, my government, we're center left, Liberal Democrats, we're we're a little neurologic about nuclear power, so we'd rather have conventional submarines. So it they had to transform all of this stuff into conventional. And <clears throat> when a new government came in, uh, led by Scott Morrison, uh, he immediately turned to the Biden administration and said, "No, we we should." Uh, uh, move toward nuclear submarines. And he approached Kurt Campbell, uh, his old friend, because Kurt had a lot of business interests in, in Australia and said, uh, we'd like to buy these submarines from the United States. So what infuriated Macron and his government, including foreign minister Jean-Yves Le Drian, was that uh, they thought they were stabbed in the back by the United States on this. And in fact, <clears throat> when they, when Macron raised the issue with Biden, he stayed studiously silent about what was going to happen with it because they had picked up rumors that this was, this was in the works. Uh, but there was nothing that in the end that the French could do because it was a decision by uh, the Australian government to renege on the contract. I don't know whether they had to pay damages or penalties to the French, but uh, they lost this serious, this conflict uh, contract, which was terribly unfortunate because if the United States is truly looking for a strong set of allies in, uh, in uh, the Indo-Pacific, France has a lot it can contribute. It has five bases in places like Djibouti and uh, UAE and, uh, and New Caledonia and French Tahiti. And it also has 2 million of its own citizens who live out there. Uh, and the military to military con uh, contacts are excellent. I was uh, <clears throat> invited to uh, last May um, to uh, Tahiti by the commander of French naval forces there to witness the um, the Jean d'Arc exercises that they do every year with the Seventh Fleet, and they were both uh, both the French and the American commanders were saying the 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 uh, the cooperation between the two militaries is superb, and I think they were also <clears throat> for uh, 
frustrated to see this this happen. But they're trying to rebuild the relationship, um, and uh, but it, this has caused a a lot of damage to uh, uh, France's faith in uh, the United States. So it's an important issue. Hi there. Um, yes, we're so happy to have you and learn so much today. Although my grandchildren are going to be, um, uh, uh, I'm going to make them aware of, of their 30 years and what they have to look forward to. Uh, however, in your opinion, do you think that uh, if we sent those planes to um, uh, Ukraine, that Putin would actually go through with his threat to use nuclear, or should his bluff be called at some point? Well, it's, uh, you mean to um, set up a no-fly zone? I think that that's probably, <clears throat> that would not be a wise decision. I think most uh, leaders in NATO agree with that. I think there are other things that can be done and should be done and perhaps are being done in terms of sending anti-aircraft missiles, uh, drones, because uh, they're the nature of <clears throat> Warfare has changed so dramatically in the last few years that you don't need these big, heavy, fixed systems uh, that um, uh, that are sometimes more vulnerable uh, than these uh, swift and more mobile uh, units. So I think if we can break the logjam in our bureaucracy and get this material out there, which uh, uh, and do it at uh, the speed necessary by war, then I think the, it will strengthen the uh, Ukrainian resistance. They're already doing quite well <clears throat> just with some Turkish drones, um, the Javelin um, anti-tank weapons that we've sent, but we could send them more. And I think there's a determination now given the outrage <clears throat> expressed by the president and others about these atrocities, that there won't be um, the resistance that we've seen in the past to going ahead with more and more of these weapons. And, you know, if, if uh, Putin complains uh, and says that we're running the risk of war, well, he only has to look at what his army has done in Ukraine to, to see, um, see what the real cause is. On a much lighter note, I wanted to thank you uh, for your contributions to the public discourse, along with Senator Bill Bradley. I'm a big fan of college basketball. So, and then on a more serious note, what gaps should be plugged in the sanctions that we are not doing right now? Well, that's a good question. I'm not, um, I think that it's, Focusing so much on these oligarchs is not so uh, such a crucial issue. I think the most uh, important sanctions have been levied against the uh, Russian Central Bank uh, and the other banks and pre prevent the Russians from <clears throat> moving their money around. But <clears throat> even more effective would be a way to uh, um, stop the, the flood of payments for oil and gas that have been going to, to Russia. I mentioned the figure, 350 billion this year, you know, three times what they earned last year. Now it's partly because the oil prices have soared above $100 a barrel and they could go even, even higher. Uh, but uh, this is what is feeding the war machine in Russia and we have to find a way to, to put an end to that. It would be difficult. I mean, a country like Germany would suffer economically, but if there was a pooling of energy resources and imports, which is what Macron is arguing, we need a giant leap forward toward a more integrated European market for energy, <clears throat> that this would be an effective way, not only to uh, uh, prevent shortages, but also to establish a more cohesive uh, 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 market for the Europeans that would, would could be used as a way to propel the momentum uh, toward uh, toward greater political integration. Thank you. 
As you mentioned, uh, prior to the invasion, many European governments uh, were very reticent to acknowledge that Putin would actually go across and invade Ukraine. In your view, why was that particular view so strong in Ukraine itself, and especially by Vladimir Zelensky? Well, I think it's um, it shows you how different our perceptions are. We think uh, no rational leader would subject himself or his, and his country to the kinds of devastating sanctions that <clears throat> were threatened at that time. But <clears throat> Putin looks at things entirely differently. And he had built up a war chest, $600 billion uh, in anticipation of these sanctions and that he thought that he could ride this out. So uh, the way Europeans were looking at it was not the way that, that, um, that Putin himself sees it. <clears throat> and I think that's, that's been a big, big problem in uh, the dealing uh, with, uh, in dealing with uh, Putin over the years. I mean, Macron confessed to me, he, he said, when I was elected president, I invited Putin to uh, uh, France as my first state visitor because I want, I realized how important it was to prevent him from embracing China. We wanted, we needed to pull him back toward the West. And he mentioned that <clears throat> I'm convinced that he's a, he's the a son of St. Petersburg, the Western leaning city in, um, in Northern Russia. And I said, well, don't you think he's rather a son of the KGB? Yeah. And um, that's what drives his, his, his rationale. And Macron says, well, we disagree on that. But um, <clears throat> I think that was the hope he, he had. He brought on that, that first trip, he took uh, Putin on a tour of Versailles because he said, okay, if he wants to be the new czar, I'm going to show him all this history and try to make him feel that he could become like the, the former czars or like Peter the Great, somebody who became an ally and a friend of the West. Um, but um, it, it, didn't, it didn't happen. And I think he was uh, <clears throat> mystified. Uh, we, in one of our conversations he says, you know, I don't understand. If I were s sitting in the Kremlin in Putin's chair, I would look east and I would see the encroachment of Chinese, the Chinese population in Eastern Siberia, which is happening. China is occupying lands that are left undefended by uh, Russian soldiers. And I'd be worried about Islamic uh, uh, fundamentalist fanatics in the South coming up as the, he fought a war in Chechnya against them and, and others in Central Asia. And this would not be the time to pick a fight with the West. Um, but, you know, Putin thinks differently. And he said to him, <clears throat> he said in one of the conversations, Putin uh, looked at me, he said, France is a small country. Russia is a big country, 11 time zones. We think in much grander scale than a small country like France. So. This is, I think the difference in perception explains how both the Europeans and the Russians have been unable to establish a connection and, and us as well with the Russians. You mentioned the issue of migration. To what extent do you think that is the issue that allows the, as you say, illiberal leaders of Hungary and Poland to rise or do you think there are other factors that are causing people who really are almost autocrats themselves, but they're getting elected? And what really explains that? It seems to me that the migration issue is a huge forward looking problem. Well, let's say in the case. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, there's a there's no doubt a, an element of racism there. I mean, when when Urban and uh, and and other leaders in Eastern countries were rejecting Syrian immigrants. It was because they were fearful of having to deal with a 
Muslim influx in their population. Uh, the attitude of the Poles <clears throat> toward the Ukrainians has been like welcoming their, uh, their cousins into the country. Two million have come in and they've been very well treated. Um, and even quite a number into Hungary and Romania have also been well treated, but they're seen as uh, fellow Europeans. Uh, no, I think it's uh, driven uh, largely by, you know, identity politics, kind of the, uh, similar to what we have here. Uh, Putin, as well as Urban, talk about reestablishing Christian family values, even though they may not practice them themselves, given their array of mistresses and, and illegitimate children and all that. But they love to rail against gays and lesbians and point to the West and say, look at the decadence that we see in the West because of, because of all of this. So I think it's a cultural identity politics is, um, is, a, big, uh, is a big issue that drives this. <laughs> I have a couple of questions that were um, instigated by reading the cover to your book. One statement was that Macron has a special relationship with Trump. And the other is that Macron would like to uphold the European ideal. So if you could tell us more about what that ideal is. And then my third question has to do with the restarting of the nuclear power plants in Germany they've shut them all down or they're in the process. Would that be part of the solution? Sure. Yeah, all, all very good uh, questions. Um, <clears throat> I would say, uh, 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 first of all, <clears throat> in terms of, uh, wait, I'm trying to keep the three points in. The first one was, oh, the Trump relationship. Yeah, yeah Trump. Okay, now he, told, he said that I, I, I feel a special kinship with Trump, even though we, our personalities are totally different, um, but we are both uh, maverick, political mavericks who destroyed the existing political order, the established parties. Uh, we'd never been elected to public office before. And uh, we liked to, uh, to, we wanted to see a greater integration of the public and the private sectors, bringing business uh, attitudes into uh, government. And so they thought they had a, <clears throat> a special bond there. And Macron told me, he says, uh, I thought it might work for a while. And <clears throat> we were walking in the, on the grass in the, in the back of the White House. And he said to me, you know, Emmanuel, I find it really interesting that uh, we have this symmetry that your wife is 24 years older than you and my wife is 24 years younger than me. And he says, well, I'm not sure what you mean by that. But anyway, <clears throat> he, he tried to wine and dine them, invited uh, the Trumps to uh, uh, a nice restaurant, the Jules Verne and the, up in the Eiffel Tower uh, for a nice steak dinner. Um, but uh, the whining and dining didn't succeed because they were just... Uh, Trump was too erratic and could never follow through on it. And basically it fizzled out. So, but it was an effort. He saw himself as the Trump whisperer in Europe. And because uh, um, Angela Merkel didn't want to be in the same room with him. She, yeah. she had an allergy to Trump and uh, couldn't stay. And of course he didn't like her either. You've heard probably the anecdotes about him throwing candies at her here. Angela, don't say I never gave you anything, you know, this sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> second point on uh, uh, Macron's attitudes toward Europe. I titled the book, The Last President of Europe because I, I'm convinced that among, uh, and this includes Angela Merkel, the, the existing uh, leadership in Europe, He's the only one who really espouses the values and ideals of Europe's founding fathers after World War II, like Jean Monnet and uh, uh, you know, Robert Schumann and Paul Henri Spock. They all wanted to make uh, war unthinkable by creating a tightly, well, a political and economic uh, community of nations in Europe. 
sort of a sort of a kind of United States of Europe. <clears throat> and Macron is since he is without a doubt the most pro-European president France has had uh, since the war. And he's uh, managed to bring the population along with him. Uh, for the first time, a recent poll showed that uh, um, a majority of French believe in the idea of a European army. Uh, so they're getting beyond their chauvinistic, nationalistic uh, views. Uh, that's why this challenge represented by Marine Le Pen is so, so critical because it will be the test of whether his pro-European global views can prevail against somebody who wants to retreat into this nationalistic um, um, approach. Um, and finally, your third point was on... Oh yeah, na the nuclear, the nuclear. Yeah, no, I think, and this is where, uh, again, Macron has shown uh, very uh, <clears throat> far-sighted leadership. He's just announced they're going to build six new uh, nuclear reactors. And he says, the reason why I want to do that is because if you're serious, if we are going to be serious about cutting carbon emissions, we have to greatly expand our nuclear energy sector because this is, and now with these new um, uh, reactors, they can deal with the waste problem much more effectively. Uh, but if any, if you're serious about cutting carbon emissions, there's no question that nuclear power is the way to go because it doesn't produce those emissions. Now, Germany, I think this was one of the big uh, errors uh, of Angela Merkel and uh, she panicked after the Fukushima uh, 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 crisis in, in Japan. And she even, uh, she, so she announced the shutdown of uh, nuclear power stations by the end of this year, all of them. Uh, there are, I think, three or four more that are still in, in operation. But some of my friends who are leading figures in the Green Party said she's gone much further, went further than even we were advocating because we knew it was impossible to achieve. So I think the current government, which includes the Greens, um, and led by Social Democrat Olaf Scholz, may indeed extend the life of those remaining nuclear power plants uh, because that's going to be necessary. Belgium has done just that. Uh, for uh, extending the life of their current nuclear power plants by another 10 years. Uh, and I think that's what Europe will need to do, including Germany. One last question. Uh, yeah, thank you again for coming out to Denver. I appreciate being here. Uh, the question I have is, what does it take for Europe to really be a unified group? I mean, it just, like, I've read history for so many years, we've got the, the fighting that's going on. What do we need? To, what are we striving for? What what degree of unity we, we need? Is that, you know, the, the, in my mind, if you're thinking you got a single locus of decision making, like in Russia, UK, US, or China, is one. Can the Europeans going to reach that to one decision? How are you going to get the uh, the cooperation of the, of the rural people, the skeptics, um, to just think about the past? Well, I think they could start with. Uh having some pan-European uh, pan uh, elections, like for the, elect the, the president of the European Co Executive Commission. That should be done on a, uh, on a Europe-wide basis uh, rather than uh, um, uh, negotiated among the, the political parties. Uh, they could have uh, more powers for the European Parliament, uh, expand it uh, in such a way <clears throat> that uh, and, and also the funding, uh, raising finances at the European level, which they started to do uh, last year with the, the pandemic. Uh, and I think uh, as Mario Draghi has proposed, they need to expand that even more, create a common energy policy, create uh, the basis for uh, a common European defense um, and raise that money uh, not through national taxes, but uh, by borrowing money at the European level, which they can do and do very effectively. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it.
questions, uh, you can come up and ask them to them directly. But I really appreciate your, your conversation tonight and being here. And um, just so you know, we have an association with the American Committee on Foreign Relations, and this is one of the speakers that they've introduced us to. And I just wanted to also, to the extent they're listening online, thank them also. So thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. few announcements here, uh, which is usually a reason to leave, but um, I wanted to tell you, we have, uh, I think I've talked about it in the last two or three meetings, we have a volunteer speakers program, and we've been working with uh, some schools in the area. Uh, if you have an expertise in the domain of international, um, we would like to share it with the Denver area and the high schools in this area. Speakers are invited to local schools and businesses as and other outside events. The proceeds and any proceeds from any presentation will be donated to the DCFR uh, and will help support other programs such as this. And uh, if you need any information on that, I think Katie may have, I think she's outside actually. Katie, um, you, you can reach out to Katie also. I believe there's, uh, I think you can help them out too. Are you working with that at all? A little bit, yeah. Okay, yeah, so there's a few people in here. And I can at least direct you in, in the direction of this. Um, also, our next eat, it, our next dinner is in just two weeks. Uh, look out for the invitation. It's April 19th. It's called He Said, She Said, or She Said, He Said, depending on which perspective you have. It's contrasting perspectives in foreign policy with Barbara Smith and Larry Sampler. I will say it's dynamic. Uh, it's going to be fun. Uh, it's going to be interesting. They both have a background in international policy, and uh, they're going to create a great presentation. I've seen it. Um, actually, I think there may be a version of it on YouTube, but it's it's excellent, and we're looking forward to them coming to speak to us uh, or debate with us. Um, and finally, and this is really a key event, uh, every year we have the Global Engagement Award. And one of the things I would like to tell you about, and I'm not at this microphone so they can hear me online. Uh, <laughs> Our last event is the Global Engagement Award, and we're going to um, give it to uh, Brian Vogt of the Denver Botanic Gardens. For those of you who are not familiar with the, the Denver Botanic Gardens, which I'm sure a few of you are not familiar with it, but um, it is one of the premier uh, gardens of its kind, and it does a lot of work in the international domain and engagement, and we are very happy to host that event. We're going to have a dinner at the Botanic Gardens. Uh, it's going to be a spectacular event. It's going to also uh, be on May 31st, so look out for that when it comes out. Um, we probably will have some intervening events over the summer, just so you know, and, and also some other events that may arise as we uh, have people come into town. So um, we'll just keep a, keep a look out on your emails and also on our website. Um, the other thing I want to remind you of is we do have already a beginning for next year that's going to be spectacular. It's going to be even better as we fill out the entire year, but really hope you can uh, rejoin, encourage others to join, uh, bring some, uh, some, some younger people, uh, college students, and some uh, high school if you want, and, and for young professionals. Uh, really would just love for us to really make an expansive outreach into the community. Um, and as you all know, don't keep this a secret. We have great speakers and a great time and great uh, opportunity to just hang out with people for the evening. So uh, look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks and uh, look forward to seeing all of you at the Global Engagement Award. Thank you. Yeah.